An earlier section addressed the fact that an increase in a current flowing in a loop causes an increase in the magnetic field produced by that current. The increasing flux induces an EMF in the circuit that opposes the change in the net magnetic field through the loop. The changing magnetic flux through the first loop does more than induce a current in the second loop. It also induces a current in the first loop itself, one that moves counter to the original current. Lenz's law states that as the magnetic flux changes in the second loop, the induced current creates a magnetic field that opposes change in the first field. This is known as self-induction. Grab the loop with your right hand. Your fingers point through the loop in the direction of the opposing magnetic field. Your thumb represents the current created by the opposing magnetic field. Notice that your thumb points opposite the direction of the primary current, hence the name back EMF. We know from Faraday's law that the EMF equals the negative rate of change of the flux. However, the flux is equal to B dot A, from which we can conclude that flux is proportional to the magnetic field strength. Moreover, we know that magnetic field equals the permeability of free space times the number of loops per unit length times the current. We can conclude from this that B is proportional to the current. These two proportionality relations imply that the flux is proportional to the current, and therefore the rate of change of flux is proportional to the change in current. From this relation, we obtain a quantitative description of inductance. Inductance is the proportionality constant that links the rates of change of flux and current and is equal to the number of loops times the flux divided by the current. We rewrite Faraday's law in the form stating the induced EMF equals the negative inductance times the rate of change of current, which is equivalent to the inductance equals the negative induced EMF divided by the rate of change of current. Therefore, we can rewrite the inductance as the ratio of the EMF and the current rate. The SI unit for inductance is the Henry, represented by capital H, which we know from this equation equals one volt second per ampere. Recalling that resistance equals EMF divided by current, we can conclude that inductance is a form of resistance. Inductance creates a back EMF which opposes and reduces change in current. Suppose that you have a very long solenoid of length L with N turns. Let's find its inductance. Let's start with the formula relating the magnetic field strength to the current and number of loops per length. The magnetic flux through each turn equals the magnetic field strength times the cross-sectional area times cosine theta. Since the angle between the magnetic field in the center of the solenoid and the area of each loop is zero degrees. The cosine factor can be left out. The magnetic flux equals, then, the magnetic field times the area. Substituting the expression for B into the magnetic flux equation gives flux in terms of current, area, and loops per length. Next, we put this expression for flux into the inductance formula, N times flux squared divided by the current, which gives the final expression for inductance. Inductance equals mu zero times n squared times area divided by length. What is the value of inductance in a 10 centimeter long solenoid containing 355 loops, each with an area of 0 0.250 square centimeters? Try again. Try again. Try again. Correct. If this solenoid had an iron core with a magnetic permeability of 5 mu zero, what would the inductance be? Try again. Correct. Let's apply the principle of conservation of energy to a mass oscillating horizontally back and forth on the end of a spring. 
the total energy E equals the energy stored in the spring, one-half Ka squared, and the kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. The energy of motion, one-half mv squared, reaches a maximum in the middle of the oscillation, just at the point the energy in the spring, one-half Ka squared, reaches zero. As the oscillation continues, the energy stored in the spring reaches a maximum at the point the energy of motion reaches zero. If an inductor and a capacitor are hooked in a circuit, it behaves in a manner similar to a mass spring system. The energy of the inductor's magnetic field, one-half Li squared, reaches a maximum as the electric field of the capacitor, Q squared divided by 2C, reaches zero. Then the energy stored in the capacitor reaches a maximum as the energy of the conductor decreases to zero. The mass spring system exhibits simple harmonic motion. The force acting on the spring according to Hooke's law is equal to minus the spring constant K and times the distance of the mass from the equilibrium point. From Newton's second law stating force equals mass times acceleration, we know that mass times acceleration plus the spring constant times the displacement x equals zero. Rewriting acceleration as the second derivative of distance with respect to time yields the differential equation for the mass spring system. Another characteristic of simple harmonic motion is that the distance from the equilibrium point equals the amplitude times the cosine of the angle theta, where theta equals the angular speed omega times time. The energy in the capacitor equals the charge squared divided by two times the capacitance. This capacitor energy is analogous to the energy stored in the stretched or compressed spring, one-half kx squared. As the capacitor discharges, the energy goes into the magnetic energy of the inductor. This energy is one-half times the inductance times the square of the current. This inductance energy is analogous to the kinetic energy of the oscillating block. In both the electrical and the mechanical systems, energy is lost as heat. The total energy of the circuit system, U, equals the energy stored in the capacitor plus the kinetic energy in the inductor. The total energy of the system, U, is constant. If we take the derivative of this constant with respect to time, we get zero equals the derivative of the inductor and capacitor energies. dQ dt is the current I. Thus, the second derivative of the charge is the same as the first derivative of the current. Substituting this result in our equation and canceling the current gives us a second order differential equation. Next, we solve for Q. Note the similarity of form between the mass spring system differential equation and this one. The mass spring system is a harmonic oscillator, so the LC circuit must also be a harmonic oscillator. For a simple harmonic oscillator, the second derivative of x with respect to time equals negative omega squared times x, where omega is the angular frequency and equals the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. The general solution of this differential equation can be written as x equals the amplitude times the cosine of the angular frequency times the time plus the phase constant theta. Using our comparison chart, we can write that the charge of the capacitor Q equals the maximum charge times the cosine of the angular frequency times the time plus the phase constant theta, where in this case, the angular frequency equals the square root of one divided by L times C. To obtain an expression for the current as a function of time, we take the derivative of the charge of the capacitor with respect to time to find the current equals negative angular frequency times maximum charge capacitor times the sine of the angular frequency times the time plus the phase constant theta. Thus, we find that the LC circuit is a simple harmonic oscillator that follows the same conservation of energy rules that apply to the analogous mechanical systems. 
For an LC circuit with L equals 3 millihenries, C equals 10 picofarads, and an EMF of 12 volts, determine the charge and current as functions of time. Try again. Correct. 